Greetings, everyone. This is African Esquire TV. Welcome to another video where we're going to be talking about some topics going on in the African world. Briefly, please take some time and add yourself to my Telegram group. There you will get updates from me on different content that I post or things that I'm speaking at. So that is a way that you can keep track of things that I am doing as far as trying to speak out for the people. And also please add yourself to the channel Odyssey. Yes, we are on YouTube, but we're also an Odyssey, which is a decentralized version of YouTube. The purposes of these platforms is to ensure that censorship does not become an issue because we know that these major social media, multimedia platforms are controlled by many of the people that we're criticizing. So briefly, please do those two things and I hope that you enjoy this video. Peace family, welcome back to African Esquire TV. I'm your host, Tony Cherie. I was gone for a few weeks, so I'm very happy to be back. If you don't know, um, my family, my husband is Ghanaian, so we were traveling, we went to Ghana and got to spend some time there. I had some time to do some observations on some things, and so maybe in a later video we can get into some of that, but I'm very happy to be back. And of course, we have to get into some of the things that are happening to African people all over the world. In particular, a lot of people are talking about the issue of Haitians being deported at the U.S. border inside of Texas. This is how one U.S. Border Patrol officer received Haitian migrants crossing the Rio Grande coming back with food to a camp they've set up in Texas. Hey, you use your women? This is why your country because you use your women for this. You go, no, that way. Hey, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. We've got our families inside, dying of hunger. We've had to go out to buy food. No! You can see the tense scenes here. The Border Patrol are trying to stop people getting back into the camp after they went across to Mexico to get food, they say, because there isn't enough food for them actually there in the camp. There's more than 12,000 migrants, mostly Haitians, in the camp that sprung up in Del Rio, Texas, over the last two weeks. They want asylum, but US authorities are overwhelmed. This is just the latest flashpoint in a months long surge of people illegally crossing the border. And there's little in the camp for them. Sanitary products? There aren't any. Food? There isn't any either. They don't give you anything. We met Nicholas on the Mexican bank of the river, searching for food and medicine for his family. He hadn't realized until we asked him about it that US authorities are also now flying Haitians back home. There's planes now going to port and people. What yeah. do you think about that? What kills me about that is that everyone knows what we Haitians are going through. There's no president. Crime is high. Students can't go to school. There's no work. The economy is down. People can't put up with that. Deportation is not good for us. This morning, a 24-7 mission on the Texas border. A group of migrants, most from Haiti, spilling onto the shoreline beneath a border bridge. Thousands of men, women, and children waiting days in triple-digit heat for their chance to claim asylum. Late Saturday, Border Patrol, National Guard, and Texas State Troopers descending on the scene to try and slow down the surge. We need the administration to call this what it is. This is a crisis. The Department of Homeland Security sending 400 additional Border Patrol agents and resuming deportation flights to Haiti within the next 48 hours, adding our borders are not open and people should not make the dangerous journey. Yet so many already have. DHS saying till recently, thousands lived in South America. This Haitian man sharing he paid 5,000 pesos for help reaching the Texas border. So if you have not heard about this story, it's being reported that less than a year after Joe Biden entered the presidential office with vows to bring a new humanitarian approach to the nation's immigration system, the Biden administration is carrying out what could be the largest mass expulsion of would-be asylum seekers in recent American history. Virtually none of those removed from the country, nearly all of whom are Black, 
have received their day in court, nor will they under the administration's current plan. It says nearly all of the expelled, including families and children, will be flown to Haiti, a country the administration has characterized as a state teetering on the brink of collapse last month. With the expulsions already underway and expected to intensify in the coming days, advocates are bracing for an already hor horrifying human rights nightmare to become far more dangerous. On Monday, the Department of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, visited Del Rio to receive an operational update from local and federal authorities. And he said this, this is not the way to come to the United States. He's saying this to the Haitian immigrants. He's saying the security reported that 600 federal officials from the border patrol agents to the Coast Guard personnel are now aiding in a massive effort to expel these Haitians and any other foreign nationals who might be with them. So this is a hor horrible situation, obviously, that's happening. Um, and it's been happening really um, ongoingly, really, because we know Haiti as a country has been devastated by the United States imperialist policies inside of this country and also French imperialism as well. So what we're going to talk about in this particular video is why is it that it seems as many Africans are observing, as many people all across the board, honestly, are observing, it seems that the Haitian population is being treated very differently than other migrant population or other asylum seekers. And if you understand the history of Haiti, you understand that this is not something that just happens to be occurring. This is actually something that is directly inside of the United States foreign policy to treat Haitians as a different classification of migrants than they would anyone else. So before we get into that, I do want to go over some African news. Um, so we're going to just take a moment and go through some headlines, and then I'm going to go more in depth into why it is that the United States is treating Haitians at the border differently than they would any other immigrant group. If you don't know, the United Nations is in full swing right now, the United Nations being the body that is supposed to be representative of the world. And right now, a coalition of the Meat Industry Association is um, pushing at the United Nations in the UN Systems uh, System Summit to boost global meat consumption and promote intensive livestock farming despite its environmental footprint. The findings have prompted the UN Special Repertoire on food on the right to food to warn powerful agribusiness interests um, that they could dominate the discussion at the United Nations. And this is something that's very important, and this is why I wanted to report it, because we should understand that the food industry, the meat industry, the agricultural industry, that this has a direct effect on many African people, because oftentimes the lands that they're using to push these industries are lands that are occupied by indigenous Africans. Now, they said the document runs counter to the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for Reduction in Meat Consumption, particularly in rich countries to tackle climate change. And they warned that a failure to switch to more sustainable land use could harm efforts to global warming. And of course, that is the primary concern of many groups. Um, global warming affects all people, Africans probably worse if you look at how the global south is affected versus countries in the global north. So this but, is an important thing to know that the United Nations, once again, is becoming dominated by corporate interests, particularly interests that go in um, that are in um, the favor of capitalism in favor of Western imperialism. And also it's important to keep in mind that the United Nations food um, their um, food, um, their F UN food system summit, it's really about trying to ensure that indigenous people who are starving many times because of the capitalist system are supposed to be given the right to food. And we understand that this right to food has to necessitate control over their lands and control over the resources. However, the United Nations, as any type of imperialist ran industry or imperialist ran institution, will not acknowledge it as such. So this is is something to be aware of that's happening right now. We talk many times on this channel about Paul Kagame, and it seems like one of his uh, dissidents is now being sentenced to 25 years in prison. And this one happens to be one who many of you know of. It was the person who Hotel Rwanda was based off of, his name Paul Rusas Bingina. If I butchered his name, please forgive me. But he is the person who Hotel Rwanda was based on. 
And he was sentenced to 25 years in prison for terrorism charges. So this is just something to be aware of. It says in Rwanda, opposition leader Paul Rusa Benjina has been found guilty of terrorism and sentenced to 25 years. He's credited with protecting lives of some 1,200 people who were refugees at the hotel he managed during the 1994 Rwandan genocide. So I don't know if you guys have thoughts on this. Is he guilty? Is he not? But regardless, it's something that a lot of people are critical of, um, particularly because we know that in Rwanda, dissidents have many times been, if not killed, if not disappeared, they have been imprisoned. And lastly, inside of the country of Kenya, um, 2.1 million, 2 million Kenyans are at risk of starvation. This is something that's very serious. It says an estimated 2.1 million Kenyans, and let that sink in, 2.1 million, that's a lot of people. They face starvation due to a drought in half of the country. The National Drought Management Authority said people living in 23 countries across the arid north, northeastern and coastal parts of the country will be in urgent need of food aid over the next six months after poor rains uh, between March and May of this year. The crisis has been compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic and previous um, poor rains, and it's said is predicted the situation will get worse by the end of the year. The affected regions are usually the most food insecure in Kenya due to high levels of poverty. This is an important thing to know, particularly because we should know Kenya is one of the countries that are really at the forefront of what some people are calling a, a revitalization of Africa. But what I would call the new poor to um, to uh, modernize Africa into a neo-colonial empire that's more controlled but looks beautiful at the same time. So we see a lot of new development happening in Kenya as far as infrastructure, as far as buildings, as far as skyscrapers and housing developments and things like that. But what we don't see is development of the poor. We don't see development of those who are disenfranchised, development of the indigenous populations who are dispossessed of their land and food and water. And this is, these are the times whenever we see that this is important to actually be in control. So this is something for many people, if you're in Kenya, if you're someone who's thinking about repatriating to Kenya, this is something for us to consider. What does it mean for a country to be developed as far as having a business sector, but not having development to protect people? Because they're saying this is because of drought and because of the locusts and things like that. But we should understand that there are ways to organize your society for these disasters that are always going to be the they're always going to be a possibility. So please uh, keep in mind that development does not necessarily in inside of a neo-colonial state never means development for the people who are poor. So now for the story at hand, we're going to talk about why the United States government does not care about the Haitian immigrant population and does not feel like they need to even pretend that this population is different or is, is special, really. Now, this goes back to the reason why Haiti is in the condition that it is today. And if you don't understand that, then you're not going to understand United States immigration policy to rotations. So we're going to just hit some, some major points about what has happened in the past that created the situation in Haiti. Haiti is has not always been an impoverished nation. Haiti, I believe, is the worst, um, is, is considered the most impoverished country inside of the Western Hemisphere. Um, but if you know anything about Haiti, you know that that was not always the case. There was a, case, a time where Haitians were in control, they were self-sufficient, they were not inside of this decrepit, to decrepit condition. And the question has to be, why is it that globalization always comes with African people being put inside of a part of society where they are completely isolated from having some type of control over their destinies? Meanwhile, people outside of their countries are the ones to exercise that same control. So this has to be by design. All of these things are by design. African disenfranchisement is by design. And the more and more that we allow these Western imperialists to pretend that they care for African people, meanwhile, at the same time pushing for policies that have been proven decade after decade after decade to be designed to rid these people of their rights, rid these people of their possessions, their communal possessions, until we are able to correctly call to call, call to order these institutions, then this is going to be the reality of many African people all over the world. So let's go into some of the history of Haiti. Now, obviously, we have to go back to the fact that Haiti was not um, a sovereign country. It was a country that was colonized by France, Africans from 
the continent were transported to this country in order to work inside of the plantation system for the European capitalists. And in this case, the capitalist was France. But I'll also understand that all the capitalists have to work together. That's the way that Western Western white supremacy, imperialism, colonialism, all these systems work. It's never one country trying to conquer Africans independently. And because of that, whenever Haiti overthrew France, obviously the United States, who was a close ally as far as Western interest to France, they seen this as a threat to them. And this led to a long history of Haiti being not just a enemy of France who imposed on them a huge debt that would amount to about $21 billion today. They forced them to pay that to France. Not only did that happen, but Haiti became an enemy to the United States because of the freedom that those people exercised. And because of that, the United States has consistently ensured that they were, um, that they were put inside of the Haitian affairs. They have consistently ensured that they were the ones that were dominating inside of the internal policies of this island and that has never ended to this day. So let's just talk about some of the major things that the United States did. In 1915, the U.S. military invaded Haiti. Yes, 1915. This and was over the next 19 years. It executed dissidents and instigated a system of forced labor. Um, U.S. soldiers were dispatched to Haiti's shores in 1915 to stabilize a country that they said was in disarray after a presidential assassination. Now, while they were there, one of the worst uh, massacres happened inside of history. It was December 6, 1929, during a 19-year American occupation that began 100 years ago. Um, the Kays massacre took place during a demonstration and was part of a nationwide strike and an ongoing local rebellion, U.S. military battalions fired on 1,500 people, wounding 23 and killing 12. We spoke about how France had put this large, crazy debt on the Haitian people. Well, by 1950, Americans were afraid that this debt that Haiti had to pay back was going to um, tie them too closely to their former colonizer. So because of that, one of the first actions that the U.S. took was that at the start of the occupation, they moved Haiti's financial reserves to the United States and then rewrote its constitution to give foreigners land owning rights. So when you under, when you ask and when you question why are the Haitian people still inside of a position where they're landless, this is the reason because the US took the liberty of rewriting a sovereign country's constitution. And, you, and the question is, when is that going to be undone? That is what decolonization means. Decolonization means tracing back the imperialist steps that have destabilized our country, destabilized our people, and met and um, institutionally dismantling these things that have occurred to our people. Now, during the 19 years of the U.S. occupation, 15,000 Haitians were killed. Any resistance the sent to the United States um, installed puppet governments was crushed. A combination of army and police model after an occupation force was created to replace the Marines after they left. Although the U.S. troops officially pulled out of Haiti, Inside of 1934, the United States exerted some control over Haiti's finances into 1947. Now, the U.S. Marines invaded Santo Domingo in 1965, and they carried out an intervention inside of Haiti inside of 1994. So this is not a one-time thing. This is something that was ongoing, and that's why a lot of people, seeing with the assassination of the Haitian president, jo Jovenel Moise, um, a lot of people are cautioning that we should not be so quick to... Um, to overlook the possibility that the United States would once again have a full out intervention inside of Haiti because it has done been done many times in the past. And let's talk about the 1994 intervention inside of Haiti. So if you don't know, the um, president of Haiti, Aristide, he was the rightful president of Haiti elected inside of 1990. And because of his uh, politics, which really were not in favor of Western imperialist politics, he was done away with as far as there being a coup that was instigated by the United States government and in replace of him was put in place a military junta. Um, now, this junta was not doing what the U.S. needed them to do. That is to be at least um, diplomatic with your um, with your terror of terrorism of the civilian populations. They were very openly killing civilians. Um, about 5,000 Aristide supporters were murdered during this time. And then um, also a lot of people were tortured, bodies left out in the open 
awful things that were happening. And obviously, this is something that's caught the attention of the world. And we see this oftentimes. You'll see the United States install a government, but once that government kind of becomes a pariah to the world, then the U.S., tries to find other ways to continue control, even if they're not going to keep that government that they installed intact still in place. Now, now in response, the United States sent their military in to Haiti and had what they call the 1994 um, Operation Uphold Democracy. Uphold Democracy. This is from a people who already installed a government, but now they're concerned with upholding democracy. Again, this is more hypocrisy from the United States imperialist machine. And we should understand that words like democracy have become propaganda to allow Western interests to dominate inside of sovereign countries, sovereign African countries, sovereign indigenous countries. So they arrive in Haiti and um, they basically put back into power President Aristide. However, they made sure that they were going to put him back into power in a way that they were going to be able to exert control over Haiti. And here is where you see a lot of the horrible policies coming about that really leads to the present conditions of Haiti. So one thing that they did is that um, they made it a contingent, they, they, they made it a requirement that Aristide, whenever he was put back into power, he had to sign agreements with the IMF and the World Bank. These are two institutions we've been very critical of on this channel because we understand these are neo-colonial institutions. Neo-colonial institutions that are the way that the West still controls the world. But Aristide was required to sign these structural adjustment policies that come from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. This opened Haiti up to foreign markets. And this is something that happens all the time whenever you see a country being forced into these agreements with the IMF and the World, World Bank, World Trade Organization. Um, Haiti's elites, despite having to face a US embargo during the military junta and having their wealth frozen by the US, still had a lot of economic power after Aristide's return. The reformist and radical program he had planned failed as a result of these policies. Now, Haiti became a country that was dependent, okay, on international financial organizations for its funding and its budget was and still is at the mercy of the international co community. You had a country go from being um, sovereign to now being a country that is completely controlled by the international by the, by the international institutions. And this is literally what handicaps many African people today. So here are some specifics of the policies put in place by the IMF and, um, and the World Bank. By the mid 1990s, um, tariffs on rice imports began falling from 35% to 3% under external pressure. In the same year, the US invested $60 billion to subsidize its own rice production. So-called dumping resulted in Haiti's production falling by 50% from 130, 130,000 to 60,000 tons. Okay, selling prices of the peasantry exposed to unfair competition with hyper-subsidized American farmer led to ruin and exodus of thousands and thousands of peasants. A vicious cycle of agricultural ruin, unemployment, hunger, foreign food aid, and possibility of competing with free food sent to the country, and again, more ruin, unemployment, hunger was generated. As a result, Haiti went from being practically a self-sufficient country in the production of staple grains of its national diet to importing massively. Although the case of rice is the most dramatic, it is far from the only one. The nation went from importing less than 20% of its food in the early 1980s to importing more than 55% from abroad today, mainly the United States and the Dominican Republic. So this tells you right here, why is it that people are trying to get out of Haiti? It's because of United States policies. It's because of the United States forcing the hand of Haitian people, saying that if you want to have your independence, you have to do this, that, and a third. And of course, those agreements only continue to, to um, ensure that the people are going to be captured by the imperialist regime. So these are all things by design, and that's the thing that people should always have inside of their analysis of the situation. Now, of course, we do have to talk again about the Clintons' um, role inside of Haiti, because we know that during the 
horrible earthquake in 2010 that many people were uh, killed and there's a lot of devastation and all of the world wanted to help Haiti. Of course, that's not true. Many capitalists seen this as an opportunity to seize lands, do things called land grabs, which is when you have a natural disaster and you see all these corporations, whenever people are fleeing from a natural, natural disaster, they seize the land of the people who have fled their lands. This happens all throughout the African world, all throughout the indigenous world. And this is what happened in Haiti. Now, Perry Clinton, of course, was very much criticized and the Clinton Foundation is very much criticized for their role in Haiti. So while Haiti was dealing with a major mess, massive natural disaster, people were raising money for Haiti saying that this is going to go to the people, but really the money was going in order to ensure that the capitalist industries were able to secure the lands of Haiti. And actually want, most of the money um, went to private contractors and um, international groups that have nothing to do with the people on the ground in Haiti who were suffering from the earthquake. Once again, the Haitian lands are being sold off to foreign capitalists and much of that is the responsibility of the United States and their industries. And this really led to the conditions where people were so, um, so being so deprived of their rights that they seen that the United States was very much directly the one who were calling the shots over their own country. And this led to a lot of the protests, which we saw last year and this year to get Jovenel Moise out of power once he was no longer president. So the land um, grabs and the uh, grabs of the capitalist industries over Haiti really led to these conditions that we see. We see people who are landless, people who don't have a say in their own destinies, people who are desperate trying to find ways to exert um, control over their own destinies, but they're being deprived of that. And what you have is what much of what happened. You have while the United States uh, felt that they had the liberty to tell the people of Haiti that they should keep their, that they're going to keep their president in power. And the people said, no, he's got, got to leave. He's no longer president. Well, while this is happening, many people who are forced to deal with these horrific conditions inside of the Haitian country fled. And this is what led to the, the, the condition that led to so many people being on a border. It wasn't just one instance. It was the earthquake. It was the different policies. It was the United States exerting control over a foreign, a, a foreign country and controlling their monetary interests. It was all of these things compounded by the French debt. All of these things have led to Haiti being the condition that it is today. So if you want to know why it is that Haitian immigrants are going to be treated differently than other immigrants, other asylum seekers, because it's because the fact is that their um, their asylum is not recognized by the United States because the United States recognizes that they could created every single condition that has led to people fleeing that country. And it was not in their plan to rescue people who were not of the elite, who were not of the upper echelon, but who were the masses of the people who suffered. And that's what you should always ask. Who are the people who the US is willing to help? It's only people who their political aspirations are going to coincide with. And in the case of Haiti, it was not in the United States plans. It was not inside of their foresight to destroy that country's economic um, economic viability. And then for the people whose lives have been completely devastated by those policies to then become uh, part of the United States or to be able to be allowed inside the United States to get some type of future for themselves and their families. That was never put inside of the calculation book whenever United States decided to interve intervene numerous times inside of this country. So what that means for us is that we should understand that whenever we are upset over the policies of the United States government um, towards African people, whenever we see that there was not supposed to be a situation where we were actually being dignified as being human beings and being given some type of recognition of people who are fleeing for their lives, whenever we see that they act this way, we have to be very clear to call them out completely on all of their works that have created our conditions. But and calling them out is not just calling them out for their past. It has to be calling them out for their present. We can't just call the United States out for what it did during the Haitian earthquake or what it did to take Aristide out of power. We can't just call them out for the past. We have to call them out for all of the foreign interests that are in Haiti today. We have to call them out for all of the United, United Nations interests that are in Haiti today. And that is going to have a difference of effect because the fact is that the people of Haiti are in a position to seize from the United States 
the things that have been stolen, seized from the foreign capitalists, the things that have been stolen from them, seized from the Western imperialist um, institutions, the things that have been stolen. And they are in a position to do that once we understand that the present realities are completely ones that are going to continue to handicap the people unless we can take back what has been stolen. Yes, the past is the past. You can't necessarily reverse it. But what we can do is decolonize our countries, decolonize our economies, and decolonize our futures. And that is going to take a radical transformation of the policies on the ground of Haiti. So as for Biden, yes, you don't have to, um, you can continue being barbaric as you've decided that you want to be for African people. But while you were deciding to be barbaric, let's talk about what policies the United States has inside of Haiti. Let's talk about the lands that the United States foreign companies are controlling inside of Haiti. Let's talk about the crops that you have basically um, use that country for to propel your own industries. Let's talk about the present reality and how you're going to stop doing that. Now, once we start organizing on the present reality, along with the fact that these people are being treated harshly, that's going to have a very different response. Because one thing that United, the U.S. imperialists do not want to do is be held accountable for the things that they are doing that create the conditions for which our people suffer. So these are some things that are happening. We should continue to work and fight and speak against all of the things that the United States has done to Haiti. And we have to do that, understanding that the present reality is also going to be uh, have to become front and, front and center. We're going to have to deal with the many corporations like Coca-Cola who have seized the lands inside of Haiti. We're going to have to deal with the many actors like the Clintons who have decided to use this op as an opportunity to propel their own futures. We're going to have to deal with all of those realities. And if we're going to deal with those realities, then we're going to have to deal with them directly, not indirectly. All these uh, CNN, you know, African people who, Black people who are just on, on, on the airwaves talking about how upset they are about the conditions as far as the how the immigrants are being treated. We also want to hear how you feel about how the Haitians are being treated in their own land by the foreign capitalists. We also want to hear about your criticisms of the U.S. policies inside of Haiti. If you're not going to talk about that, then don't use the Haitian immigrant crisis as an opportunity to propel yourself. And whenever you're looking for voters, whenever you're looking for clout, um, these things are not sincere. We should understand unless you have a true desire to see Haiti free and liberated. So that's all I have for this video. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I will see you all in the next video. Hey family, this is Tierney Cherie. I'm here to make an announcement that I'm very, very excited to make. I'm excited because I really think this is something that is important for our people. Otherwise, I would not have devoted so much time and energy towards it. So I finished my first book and the book title is Fostering False Identity, The Child Welfare System's Design of Social Control of the Black Family. Now, why is this book something that I think will be very important for our community? Well, number one, it's dealing with the system of white supremacy, particularly the way that the system has targeted our children. If you don't know, our children are literally our future. Without our children, we have no future. And so understand that the system is very crafty when figuring out what to derail first. And to me, it's no mistake that the system particularly went after the Black family. If you look at what happened whenever we were enslaved by this system and continues to go against the Black, go after the Black family, continues to go after Black children, continues to try to villainize African parents. So for that, I wanted to particularly talk about this subject. Now, the other thing that the, that the uh, book will deal with is our African identities. Why is it that our African identities are a threat to the system? Why is it that whenever we want to identify ourselves as being African, we get so much drawback inside of the Black community? I think a lot of us are not aware of the history of assimilationist thought inside of our community, this idea that we have to be close to white in order to be accepted. And so that's another subject that we delve into in this book. So I'm hoping that anyone who is Obviously, if you're a parent, a black parent, and you really want to understand why it is that these systems are going after your children, I encourage you to read this book. I hope that it will arm you with a lot of knowledge and a lot of foresight, not just about how to protect your own children, but how to organize in your community, because that's really the purpose of the book, is to say that we have to organize among ourselves in order to, to protect ourselves from this white supremacist system. And then obviously, if you're an organizer in general, this is something that I think is important for you to read, because like I said, so like I, this is a subject in the black community that we just don't discuss enough. Um, child welfare is not something that is going to get enough attention. People, obviously, we organize them around other causes, but this is one that that is really important that I feel like we have to pay more attention to.